Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is Elena Christopher, uh, Senior Vice President here at HFS. I'm delighted to welcome you to what I, I suspect will be both a very interesting uh, and also a bit of fun on our webinar today. Um, we're going to engage in some process automation myth busting 2020 version. Uh, of course, we're using myths, I suppose, as our theme to really showcase and, and have a healthy dialogue about the proliferation of automation really as a resource for any enterprise that can make good use of it. Uh, we're going to get into this narrative today with the help of two fabulous panelists. I'm pleased to have Eddie Din from Google and Francis Cardin from Pega. Uh, but Eddie, why don't, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, Eddie, why don't you, you say hello and uh, give a quick intro, please. Thank you, Elena. Hi, everyone. My name is Eddie Din. I'm a program manager within the Prod uh, Network Deploy Operations Team within Google. Super, just delighted to have you here today, Eddie. Uh, Francis, let's go over to you, please. Quick intro. Yeah, thanks, Elena. And hi, everyone. I'm uh, great to be here. I'm Francis Carden, the VP of Digital Automation and Robotics with Pega. And I've been doing UI automation and everything intelligent automation for the last 40 years. So. Uh, my role at Pega covers pretty much everything to do with intelligent automation and the many technologies that, that it touches. And looking forward to today's session. Super, thank you for that, Francis. And we will very quickly go on to a little bit of quick housekeeping. So delighted to have, for those of you who have decided to spend this hour with us today, we'll do our best to make it worth your while. Uh, we are not taking audio questions because we want to get through our content, but we most definitely want to hear from you. So please, uh, on your Zoom interface, please find the toolbar and you will see a Q&A um, button there. Use that Q&A button, essentially like a chat function, and you can sub submit your questions. We'll be monitoring them throughout. Uh, we'll try and address some real time uh, as applicable. And then we'll also try and save a few minutes at the tail end so that we can, we can address these questions. But please submit your questions. OK, so with that, what the heck are we going to talk about today? Um, well, we're doing process automation myth busting. The flow for our session today, uh, I'm going to take just a few minutes to share some of the HFS latest and greatest content on our views of the future of the automation market. Uh, and then we'll go full on enterprise spotlight on a, a little company called Google. Uh, so we want to, Google is a gigantic company, clearly, and it gets talked about and viewed in many, many different contexts. But our context today is Google as an enterprise. Uh, so Eddie will help us understand the automation journey they've been on, uh, both with uh, low-code, no-code BPM uh, and case management, as well as more recently RPA from their partner Pega Systems. Uh, and the Google Cloud platform figures heavily here, but more about that. Uh, and uh, the myths to be busted here. So the four that we came up with are uh, digital natives don't need automation. Of course not. They live in happy vacuums. Two, process debt is somehow unique only to business operations. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Three, RPA alone can drive digital transformation because it's magic. And then four, process automation is stuck on prem. Doesn't matter if you're a cloud first, your gosh darn process automation is stuck on prem. So we'll have some fun debunking these and having a healthy dialogue about them. Uh, and I do wanna make a quick mention that some of our, our our inspiration for this session today dates back to a blog that my CEO and I, Phil Fersh, put out uh, more than two years ago. Uh, so in September of 2018, I think it was around the time that UiPath got what I think may have been their Series C funding and they had these valuation uh, sort of pushing 3 billion. And so we, we called that into question slightly and Phil and I put out this piece, we called it the seven deadly misnomers. And we've got sort of these seven myths that we looked at my favorite is, and I'll, I'll call this one out because we always like to keep it real here at HFS. Um, back in September of 2018, we said one of the myths was, we'll still be talking about RPA in two years time. Well, here we are, but obviously part of our objective today is to really expand that aperture. Um, so with that, let me give you a little bit of detail. Um, so clearly if you're, you're on an HFS webinar, you may or may not know something about HFS, but I'll just take 30 seconds here. Uh, so we're a boutique research firm uh, founded in 2010. This year has been our 10 year anniversary. Let's just say all of our grand plans for a marvelous celebration 
throughout the year were perhaps scuttled. So we'll make good in 2021. Uh, but things to know about us. Uh, our mission has always been to really help enterprises, service providers, really the marketplace, um, understand the best ways to refine, optimize, and transform their business operations. Uh, and we do that through looking at various change agents like automation, uh, other levers such as IT and business process services, and always looking through the industry lens. Um, we just right from inception, when Phil founded us in 2010, uh, his vision was very much to do something different than the typical analyst firm. Uh, and so we were digital, we have been and were digital since inception. Uh, but we also kind of try and be the open source of the analyst community. So uh, I always say for the low, low price of your corporate email ID, you actually can get access to probably about 50% of the research that HFS puts out there. Uh, and we view this as very, very important because we think to have the types of uh, useful and intense conversations that we want to have to truly understand markets and how to transform business operations, you have to have some conversation starters. You have to contribute something to the community. So that's very much part and parcel with the HFS philosophy. Uh, and that of course helps us have a, a great user base and, and get the word out so we have well attended events like this. Um, so some additional background on HFS and our perspective specifically in the automation market. Uh, so way back in 2012, um, Phil put out a piece, um, it's decently infamous at this point, uh, but it was around the time that a little firm called Blue Prism had started making a lot of noise about their technology then called um, robotic automation. And Phil put out a piece saying, hey, this is something that we really should keep an eye on. Uh, as part of our own HFS mythology goes, uh, HFS uh, around the sort of 2012 time is known for actually putting the, uh, the process, the P in RPA. And as the story goes, it was the then CEO of Blue Prism, Alistair Bathgate and Phil Fersh in the, the Blue Prism headquarters, which rumor has it may have been the basement of a pub, um, but uh, put their heads together on what would be the most appropriate um, updated term. And, and thus we had RPA. Um, and so that was sort of our, our, our origin story for tracking the process automation market. Uh, flash to last year in 2019, um, we decided perhaps amidst a lot of this hype that we'll be addressing today, uh, Phil and I put out a piece and just, you can read that headline and perhaps you've seen it before, but simply stated, RPA is dead, long live integrated automation platforms. Um, the point of this piece, aside from being a nice jazzy headline, uh, was to make the point that no tool, um, not RPA, no real singular tool is going to be able to drive digital transformation. You really need the power of and, um, a variety of components to come together to, to enable you to automate broadly and throughout complicated workflow threads. Uh, but more on that later. Um, and flash to this year, and again, 2020 has been, what a, what a year this has been in, in so many different ways. Uh, but some of the bizarre silver linings of the pandemic has really been creating a burning platform for automation. And so this is a quote from Phil, but it's really, I think it, it, it uh, encapsulates the HFS view and philosophy about what automation is all about these days. Uh, it's not a tool, it's not a strategy. What automation is, it needs to be native to your organization. It needs to become a standard element of how you run your business, how you get work done how you interact with your customers, how you manage your partners. Um, so it's less strategy and tooling and much more about making it native so you can achieve those business outcomes. Um, and of course, because we're HFS, I wanna make sure I share a little bit of fresh data with you just to try and substantiate that point I made a moment ago, which is that um, the bizarre part of one of the bizarre silver linings of the pandemic is this creation of um, the real setup of the burning platform for automation. So I wanna just briefly share this data with you. We had done, um, as we typically do, we do an annual study with KPMG, really looking uh, across the purview of emerging technologies. And so we did one this year, our first batch of data came back. Yeah, it came back in March. And so we looked at this and said, it's wildly interesting. It was an initial tranche of uh, 600 enterprises an equal balance of IT and business respondents. But we said, yeah, we're knee deep in a global pandemic now. I think things are gonna change. 
Uh, and so we went back to the drawing board and we did a second sample of 300 plus enterprises to really round out the perspective. And the, the difference is, is remarkable. Um, so what you see sort of in the, that middle column there, the pre-COVID or perhaps early COVID would be more apt is you see a lot of these change agents on the left, process, auto, process automation at the top of the stack, um, certainly being aligned to um, important objectives, uh, but they weren't quite as decisive. Um, when we look at the responses from that, we say post-COVID, I wish that was true, but at least the mid-COVID sample, that additional 300, the options have changed. And you see that sort of stark contrast of going from, we're driving cost savings, obviously top line growth and improving brand value are nothing to sneeze at, but you see this very just laser-like triangulation on these technologies are essential for our future survival. And depending on what industry you're part of, because obviously the, the response by industry has been very, very different. There's a world of difference between how a bank is doing versus how an airline is doing, for example. Uh, but across all of these sectors, uh, just a really strong um, point towards these are essential for future survival. Um, and our view of what that future survival looks like is the HFS One Office organization. This is a model and framework that we introduced back in 2016. Uh, we felt it was very important for a research firm who is spending a lot of time talking about this thing called digital and digital transformation to put our stake in the ground about what do we think an organization that is digitally transforming looks like? Um, what do you get out of the bargain for going on that journey? And so our answer to that and our original stake in the ground was the one office with the simple logic being that the array of different emerging technologies combined with um, people change, process change, um, and again, the technologies is to help break down your internal silos. So it's not about the front office, the middle office, the back office. It's about using this tech and driving process change uh, and driving people change and digital fluency uh, to create the only office that matters, which is the one office with strong impact on to the, as you see on the right of the slide, to impact employee experience, which by the way, is another thing that really the pandemic has just put such a fine point on. Uh, but then of course, to also complement your customer experience as well as other constituents like partners in the bargain. So that's our baseline context for day. Uh, so as we're myth busting process automation, uh, we just wanted to take this time to be very clear that um, we're not saying that automation is dead. On the contrary, automation is essential. It's all about how do we make automation native? So let's jump into some of this content today. Um, so as I mentioned, I've got some fabulous panelists. So I'd love to toggle over to Eddie to kick us off. Um, but Eddie, let's, let's be sensible here because as I mentioned, Google is a gigantic organization. Everyone on the phone today, of course, knows the brand Google, but you're also a multifaceted company. So help us understand what part of Google you're with and what the heck you do for them. Sure. Thank you for the intro, Elena. So like I said earlier, I'm, I'm Eden. I'm a program manager within the Prod Network Deploy Operations team. Our organization helps to deploy all of our networking equipment throughout, you know, globally to support Google's global network. What that means is we we have thousands of facilities throughout the across, across the globe. And our team helps to support the people, process, training, and systems to ensure that our uh, operations run smoothly, we're able to deploy new equipment, as well as to maintain the network and help facilitate if there's any issues, repairs, and such. So why, why is our network important? Our Google Global Network supports all of the uh, services that you can see on the right, you know, small, small teams like Google, YouTube, Gmail, Stadia, Google Play, uh, Google Maps, Drive, all these services require network infrastructure to run. To run. Uh, and I'd be remiss to say that we are not, we are, we are our own customers too. Our application runs completely on Google Cloud and our team is an engineering organization that supports ourselves because we make sure that our services are up and running uh, from an application perspective, but also from a networking infrastructure side as well. Super, thank you for that detailed introduction. Uh, I love that angle too on 
it's uh, it's not just a network for others. You guys are your sort of own best customers in that. Hey, Eddie, one piece of your introduction I just really want to underscore um, is you're part of uh, a, an IT and engineering team as opposed to so-called being part of business operations. Is that right? We're definitely at the intersection of both. We roll up to the Google Cloud organization and we are completely an engineering team. We help support the business operations across the board though. So we help look at you know analytics, reporting, processes, but we all do we do it from an engineering uh, vertical perspective. So we support our engineers do their job more quickly, more efficiently, uh, with fewer resources, and we are trying to implement best practices across the board. Gotcha. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And let's dive in. So this is obviously a session today where we'll be talking about the proliferation of automation, but doing it through the lens of myth busting. So let's get to, to automation myth number one. Um, so I'd say the automation myth number one, digital natives have no need for automation because they live in happy vacuums with no legacy systems. All right, so let's crack this one open. So Eddie, obviously Google is one of the preeminent digital natives here, but there's always that sort of concept of, well, if you're a digital native, it means you don't have legacy systems and automation is so often used and tied to um, 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 being able to help legacy live another day, extend the life of legacy systems. Um, so what do you think? Do you dis agree or disagree with this uh, potential myth here? Yeah, I would say even if we have processes that run well, there's always uh, areas of improvement to help them run more efficiently or more quickly. There's a number of internal processes that we have as well as external uh, partners that we work with where there is a number of manual toil and operations that we're trying to either facilitate or uh, eliminate completely. So we're trying to free up our engineers, our coordinators, so that instead of focusing on, you know, basic day-to-day -day transactions, like opening up a website, figuring out what the tracking number is and figuring out what the ETA is, instead we can have a service automation to automate that completely away so that they have more availability and time to focus on more complex issues. Got you. Thank you for that, Eddie. And so in a nutshell, then it's, it's sort of, it, and I intentionally use the terminology of a happy vacuum or almost a bubble, which is, it's an absolute impossibility. So to some of your points about, uh, even when it comes down to some of the ecosystem that you need to interact with, um, there's always going to be a, a reason and a need to go beyond perhaps the, the sanctity of some of your very digital operations. So thank you for the perspective. Yep. Francis, I want to bring you into this, though. I mean, what do you think about this? And what do you think is a better way, perhaps, to, to think about who can benefit from automation? Because we sort of say, oh, it's just for firms that have lots of legacy. Eddie's dispelled that. What do you think? Yeah, thanks, Alina. So at the end of the day, I think the, the dichotomy really is the word automation, right? I mean, I, I joke, but it can mean anything from boiling a kettle to launching a rocket ship, right? Um, so what do we really mean by automation? And, and we break that down, you know, are we trying to automate the as is because it's a necessity for as long as the as is, is let's just call it legacy, right? It's, it's typically older processes or older systems, but as Eddie pointed out, it can also be new things. But predominantly, I think that we are moving into a, a, a world where, I mean, it's, an, it's another, a full leadership piece perhaps for another time, but I do think that we will see the death of legacy and systems and maintaining them and automating them the way we are being forced to do today. But that's for another time. Today, what we do is we're trying to automate as is processes whilst on our journey to digital transformation. Nobody really wants to go back and automate old systems, right? Ideally, you'd be like, yeah, let's just go back to the drawing board and, and build these processes and these systems in the way they should be built based on today's technology. And, and digital transformation or, or integrated automation or whatever it's called it is really where we all want to go. Um, but how do you get there, right? I mean, it's just, you've, you've got to rethink the way these processes actually run. And I, I mean, a great example is Google Ways, right? I think about, you know, the very old days of maps and then we had MapQuest and we, you know, it was still, you know, your journey was still a very manual process because you kept having to look at the piece of paper sitting beside you. And now you've got something like Waze, it's a fully automated process end to end, right? I mean, you get in your car and it will take you to where you want to go on the best route pretty much all the time. And I think that's ultimately what we want for our customers when they have an outcome 
they might want to be onboarded or they might want a new phone or they might want a new account. They want that journey to be perfect and you need to deliver that perfect journey no matter what barriers or walls or whatever you hit on the way. So strategically, when you think about robust automation and as these more and more connections to these other systems become available correctly, i.e. APIs is really one, one aspect of this, we use RPA to bridge the gap. But we need to also be thinking about end of life in those, um, those gaps. Because all the time we pile on automation on top of quote unquote legacy, we're just basically taxing ourselves and the cost of building that is, is exponential and growing. Um, and, and so that's what I see. It. It's, it's a matter of thinking digitally, borrowing tactical solutions, and therefore this vacuum thing will eventually go away. That's, that's, my, um, that, that's the way to look at it. It's not going to happen overnight, but it is coming. Got you. I appreciate that, Francis. And even in some of the comments I made earlier about the, the notion of making automation native, automation isn't just RPA, if you will. Automation is thinking of more efficient ways to get things done. Um, um, and we'll come on to this concept of process debt. I think that's a big part of sort of inherent or baked into your comments, the idea of just layering automation onto the way things are currently done. There has to be some change that occurs in this bargain. And I think that's ultimately what gets us to that, the point that you made, Francis, which is the sort of the future where we're perhaps no longer uh, in that, the sort of the legacy debt state. Um, but okay, let's, let's forge ahead with our conversation here. Uh, I wanna move on, Eddie, to get a bit more detail about um, how you and your team at Google really got involved with automation. Um, give us some more detail about what you guys were really trying to achieve and the path that you took. Yeah, happy to. So automation has has been part of our strategy for a number of years. To your point, now it's moved beyond just being a toolkit. It is really native to what we need to do. We have a number of different, surprise, surprise, we have a number of engineers within our organization. And a lot of them like to build, you know, the cool, really uh, eff effective, efficient tools. There is a uh, perspective that we have is that we need to make sure that all of these uh, tools and systems can work well together. And the direction that we wanted to go towards is putting them in place to help support what used to be a very manual and tedious process. So Project Moose came to be because we were looking for a workflow solution that would be quick to develop, you know, low code. Uh, we'd be able to tweak it regularly as necessary to fit what the business processes need. But we also needed an application that would, would play well with all the different tools that Google has. So looking at one part of our application within Moose, there is a um, dispatch uh, and engineering function where whenever there's a part of our network that needs to be deployed or a part of a network that needs to have uh, you know eyes on it or a repair done, an engineer goes into our application, Project Moose, identifies, you know, where is there a problem? What type of problem is it? And uh, when do I need to get, get it done? And our application helps to take in a bunch of different parameters across information about the site, information about the problem, who is available to schedule engineers to show up at the right place and at the right time. Got you. And Eddie, just a quick clarifying question, because you mentioned Moose, and I see this kind of funky uh, icon in the middle of your screen. <laughs> just make sure, tell us what Moose is, please. Yeah, so Project Moose is our application that we are running using the Pega platform. And we recently, in the last year, added in an additional uh, application on top of that, where, and that's where RPA fits in. So Moose in integrates with a bunch of Google tools, you know, including Google Calendar, uh, BigQuery, and other analytics tools, but it also serves as an entry point for us to interface with any third parties that we need to engage with as well to help support our network. Gotcha, that's a pretty rocking new spot there as well. Okay, mm -hmm. well, it's interesting. And this brings us into automation myth number two. Um, it's interesting hearing some of your comments and how you, you articulated to us earlier that you're part of a, an engineering team supporting the business. But part of your description there, it sort of comes with many of those smart engineers that are building out whiz bang things. Sometimes you do end up with, shall we say, diplomatically interesting ways of getting things done. So it sounds like really baked into what you're trying to do is come up with um, better ways to do things. And it brings me to this point that 
Uh, we have this concept of process debt, and I've included the, the HFS description of what we view as process debt, but it just essentially it's um, when you've got various technologies or ways of doing things, you, you come up with the corollary processes to actually address how to get things done, which allow you to achieve your task and your end goal, uh, but often through turning yourself into a human pretzel or, or others into human pretzels, because it may not be the most elegant way of getting things done. That's our view of what process debt is. Uh, and it actually say, dare I say, Eddie, it sounds like maybe you guys had a little bit of process debt at play here. Um, and so I, I'd, I'd like to just sort of try and bust this myth a little bit to say, how did process debt end up being built up within your IT and engineering focus functions? Um, did it have anything to do with propping up legacy? It doesn't sound like that, but much more about um, there's always the need to, to do things more effectively. What do you think, Eddie? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that too. So one of the places that we introduced automation is that in many in many times we have to interface with uh, third party and partner applications. So sometimes as part of facilitating uh, identifying where the problem is, we have to tap on other engineering groups or other resources who help facilitate within our within our data centers. So an example of that is let's say that there is a facility, um, you know that. Typically, it may be a bit difficult for a Google engineer to uh, access, but we have other partners who can help troubleshoot, triage, and potentially address the issue um, it, at that facility. We could tap on them, and instead of just dispatching one of our own engineers, we'll ask them for support. That interaction, though, requires us to pivot into what their systems are. And as much as we could automate from our perspective with our internal systems, we'd also want to facilitate that interaction with their system as well. And so that's where we plug in our RPA services. Gotcha, thank you for that. Francis, I'd love you to weigh in here. Um, why do you think that there's even this concept that process debt is somehow reserved only for business operations? Is it ju just perhaps because there's been so much use of process automation uh, within business functions? What do you think? Um, yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because process debt really, to me, describes all of the hidden costs, but often it's seen only as the process cost, right? How much it costs to do it manually, and then that might be people related. But underneath the covers, IT have to manage a great, a much bigger cost, as Eddie can attest to, with the cost that involved in that on, on even his own platform. Um, and, and so when you bring a tactical solution, even like RPA, on top of um, existing processes, it's really think of it as a tax on not only the process itself, which doesn't really change, but then it hides all the other costs, such as, you know, the application itself, the databases, the storage, backups, change control, QA, support, I mean, support the whole thing. And that's exponential debt. And it's not taken into account when when you just apply RPA to existing systems that you own, not typically what Eddie's describing. Eddie's describing wrapping RPA around systems that have no control on. You know, I'm sure Eddie would love all of those vendors just to provide APIs and, and have a great access to those systems, but they don't exist now. And so RPA covers that gap. But when you apply RPA to your existing processes and applications that you own, this is why IT want to push back on those tactical systems because business just see the people cost. But underneath that, it's almost like the iceberg. That cost is exponential and growing every year. I had one, one bank tell me, uh, Elena, that 94% of their IT budget was used just to keep the lights on from the existing, we can say, process debt. But we know that that really means all the stuff underneath, the, you know, in, in the bigger part of the iceberg. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And that's an astonishing figure there as well. I think it's a fair point as well. I mean, um, perhaps the process, the, the, this, this so-called myth, the leaning towards the, the business is, is because the process is what's most visible. But when you take that, that broader view, you do see that it ties in the, the closely associated technical debt, et cetera. All right, thank it, you for it, that. It adds, up, it adds up real fast and it's, you know, and I, I, I mean, just the cost of maintaining systems and all the things I mentioned and more is not to be sniffed at, but often is. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, it is definitely true uh, within our organization, there is a number of uh, process debt opportunities that we could have to help uh, facilitate and improve our processes. I mean, a lot of the Google engineers and the folks that we work with 
they have, they're very close to the ground. And so they've had experiences that uh, helped them do their work within their organization and keep our uh, network healthy and safe as long as it's been. But there's always chances, uh, opportunities for us to help improve that process, help define and capture what their learned uh, experiences have been and to help implement that in a process that can capture all of that, all of these learned opportunities. Thank you for that additional detail, Eddie. To me, yeah. one of the most important words within that description and detail there is around process improvement, because part of what I know Francis was getting at is that when you just automate an as-is process without changing or improving it, that, that has an expiration date on it by, um, by definition. Uh, and so when you engage in something a little bit different, which is um, changing, updating, improving the process, and uh, that helps you really beat down that process debt. All right, yep. so Eddie, I wanted to go back to, um, we had the slide up before, but I wanted to go into a little bit more detail on this um, to talk a bit about your actual build, what you put together and how you created your automation solution. So we know that uh, it included some elements from Pega and then because you work for a little company called Google, you have a lot of resources from the Google arsenal to bring into the mix here. But tell us more about um, your actual build and what your solution is all about here. Yeah, happy to do that as well. So a large reason why we are tapping on uh, Pega as a platform is because it is very fluid and allows us to make changes uh, very quickly. And that's not to say that our engineers can't do that as well, but we want to focus our, our engineers and our teams on what are the most complex and difficult problems you know, of keeping our network up and running all the time. So the reason why we chose, chose Pega is we wanted to help define what the business processes were, improve them, optimize them, and then build a system that helps support them. One piece that we added more recently in this past year was implementing RPA. There are a number of other automations that we have for including you know, APIs and integrations, but to what Francis was saying earlier, there are, I want to say a majority of uh, our external partners that uh, don't necessarily have the same APIs and technical capabilities that we would love them to have like a Google. Uh, so that's why we're leaning on RPA. So as part of our, our business processes, unfortunately there are times where we do need to engage with these external parties. And instead of having our coordinators and engineers, uh, you know, manually open up a website, manually populate it uh, and do that, you know, hundreds of times a day, we wanted to replace that with an automated solution such as what uh, RPA provides. Thanks for that, Eddie. Um, I think one of the key themes I hear coming out of that is what at HFS we affectionately call the, the power of and, uh, which brings us to our automation myth number three, that automation alone can drive digital transformation. I mentioned in my introductory comments that, and it sort of ties back to that RPA is dead piece that we put out in 2019. Um, it's not to bash RPA specifically or personally, uh, but it's to make the point that to achieve the ends, to, to improve those processes, as we were just talking about a few minutes back, uh, you often need uh, a, an array of capabilities as part of your toolkit, just like you were outlining. Um, but let's, let's crack open this myth number three, RPA alone can drive digital transformation. Um, so I put it up there as a myth. I've got a little bit of data to, to sort of already myth bust it. But from that same KPMG study I mentioned that we came out with earlier this year, some of the things that we were asking about is the ways in which emerging technology is being utilized. And so one of the findings was that um, enterprises strongly indicated that they're getting just greater value and they view combining their various uh, tech elements together is giving them much greater benefit than using them in isolation or using them piecemeal. And so just if you quickly unpack the slide, uh, the pie on the left there, we'll see that 64% strongly agree or agree with that. Um, the, the balance though, like what's left, there's a bunch of folks who came up as neutral. Those are perhaps um, organizations that just haven't gone down this path. So they don't have an opinion. Um, to me, what's compelling about this view is that it's just this very um, small 8% of folks that actually disagree with that approach. And then what does it actually mean then? It means well, it's impacting certainly how products are developed, but also sort of like you were articulating, Eddie, what the strategies are for enterprises about how you're trying to solve your problems, what you're actually solutioning. 
And so also in the same study, uh, our respondents indicated uh, even bigger piece, 68%, see that because of that, they see a real strong convergence um, in technologies between uh, emerging tech like automation, AI, and analytics. That, by the way, that triad is what we call the AAA trifecta, but also with things like cloud and low-code platforms really starting to converge. Um, Francis, I'd like to go to you on this for sort of perspective on debunking this myth, because I'd really like to understand your view and perhaps the, the broader PEGA view, please. Yeah, I th this comes back to, I think this is more of a, rather than the, uh, the, the, the bringing together new technologies, it's a tactical versus strategic debate, right? And tactical technologies have a place like RPA, but they are quite singular. And the very idea that the Blue Prism, as you said, called screen scraping, which is what theirs and everyone else's technology really is, it's UI automation, and they called it robotic, suddenly meant that everybody just saw that as the panacea. Um, but when you but when you think about that tactical solution, back to what I was saying before, business want that because they just need the ROI. They need to get stuff done, and they don't really think about that underlying that underlying debt. But when you put all these things together, and you can do this now, you really change the game in terms of this digital revolution. You know, it, short as five years ago. Um, it was okay to do this, but the technology and, and, and Eddie can attest to this too. It's changed so dramatically over the last five years with low code, with cloud, with Kubernetes and all these other things. Um, you literally can build new digital applications in, in days and weeks, digital processes that used to take, you know, people are always oh, going to take years. Yeah, it used to take years. But these technologies haven't stood still. In fact, I could even argue that some of the tactical technologies have stood more still than these emerging technologies. They are here today. You put together machine learning, AI, IoT, cloud, microservices, and then you orchestrate all of the work that gets done in your organization in a single entity. That is what's changing the game. And I almost say that you, if you take this approach, you become a digital native. I know it's an oxymoron. How can you be a digital native if you're an analog company? But you can build from the middle out, right? You can become that digital native company where you're not carrying this legacy debt forever. And this idea that it used to take years has gone. Um, uh, you know, I know it sounds too good to be true, right? But this is what we've been doing at PEGA and large organizations all around the world. You know, they've been building applications and replacing these legacy processes and these legacy debt in literally weeks and months, not years and decades. Um, and that, I think, is the power of the end. You put this together on a single platform and the game starts to change really, really quickly. Got it. So sort of succinct, it's the, the power of and, it really brings speed to the table uh, and, and thus essentially debunking that point that RPA or honestly any tool in its own right is really what's going to be driving digital uh, transformation. Eddie, do you want any thoughts to, to add to, to amplify Francis's comments about the power of and and just your yeah. own views on where this is going? Yeah, of course. So like you are saying earlier, RPA is only one, one service that we have along our whole automation journey, right? Uh, just like taking a look at one of the Q&A questions I think is very appropriate to answer here. Uh, there are a number of applications that are, being, that are being built, supported, and managed, but one of the difficulties that we had with you know, manual processing, it was, just, it was hard to see how long it was taking, where the issues were, and then trying to tackle those as service improvement plans. Now, with the application as it stands today with Project Moose, we have much greater visibility. We have an, the analytics reporting that Google Cloud helps to support. And then now we have very clear directions and milestones for what we want to tackle. So all these applications together holistically improve our overall business processes. The power of and. Thank you very much. Um, and to okay. add to that as well, Elaine, I think that you, you see, you've seen the rise of some of these process mining tools, which really implies that you know organizations don't even know what processes are being executed, where, why, how long, and how much. And they think that mining is going to solve that. Well, sometimes you just got to say, well, Adam, what would it look like if we redid the process today? You don't need to mine the old to know that it's old. You could rethink and reimagine the new, just as your competitors, your digital native competitors are doing, and just have a go. Just start building this stuff. And when you realize that you can do it in, 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 in you know, significantly less time than it used to, you start to make that change. Yeah, we've, we started using the terminology process intelligence as essentially as an umbrella term to log-based process mining, but also to complement and be inclusive of the, the desktop-based process discovery and flavors in between. 
Um, but we do find from talking to so many enterprises, sort of part of what you mentioned there, Francis, it is really being able to get that. It's almost the comfort of knowing what the process looks like, even if somehow intuitively and implicitly, you know it is already broken. Uh, but we, I mean, it is, it's just one of those areas um, that just continues to take off because people really yeah, want I, I think, to I think you just don't right? want to be an analysis paralysis. They're all very valuable tools to your point about this, that this is the and here, right, as well, back to that point. They're all very valuable tools. But if you, all you do is get stuck in analysis paralysis to confirm that your processes are wrong, some of these processes you should be working in parallel to re-engineer. And, and, and that's, that's my take on it. Well, fair enough. Well, so let's go on. So process intelligence has been definitely one of the darlings of 2020. Um, but I think uh, aside from automation, um, one of the other just often talked about every vendor on the planet is coming out with a refined version of their cloud capabilities. But it brings us to automation myth number four. Process automation is stuck on prem. You're, despite the fact that many enterprises who have embraced process automation are cloud first, or at least are angling to become cloud first, still roughly about based on our just scads and scads of conversations with enterprises, with RPA software firms, uh, with partners um, serving as the channel and conduit in between the software firms and the enterprises the vast lion share of RPA implementations are still on-prem. Francis, I'd like to go back to you on this, which is uh, help us understand, why do we not see more RPA in the cloud? Uh, two ways to answer that. I mean, I think the RPA vendors were struggling when you start, when you, HFS started calling out RPA is dead. I mean, we know you didn't mean it was dead. You were just setting some reality checks from the hype that was around it. And so of course, every RPA vendor then said, oh, we're gonna move to the cloud. Right, and every single RPA, and there's 200 RPA vendors out there, can run on the cloud. I get it. There's no, there's no issues. The question is, where are the enterprise apps that you're automating running? Because if they're not running in the cloud, then RPA is not running in the cloud. And if you can make an enterprise with 60,000 desktops move all those desktops to the cloud, then fine. Or if you can get them to move some of those um, desktops to the cloud, that's fine. RPA will run in the cloud. So that's kind of like, you know why you don't see as much running in the cloud as you think. But the rest of the RPA, the robot managers, the control towers, the rules engine, all of that can run in the cloud and every vendor has that, that's, that, that's a myth. But what, what really should be thinking about is that the processes that you're talking about, process automation, digital transformation, what you build today should be agnostic. You should be able to build a process, an automated process, and then decide where you want to deploy it. You may, for necessity, need to run it on-prem. But more likely, you want to be able to run it on cloud, you know. And so we partner with um, with Google and other cloud vendors where people building digital transformation on the Pega platform can run it on any cloud, or if they so choose to run it on prem. But the myth of RPA, right, of running on the cloud, I've not seen it. And maybe over time, if you've really made that push where you're going to move your fat client applications in a VM on a Windows machine in the cloud and then put RPA on top of it. I just wonder sometimes, is that a bridge too far that maybe those processes should be better re-engineered as a, as a digitally native um, uh, process? Does that make yeah. sense? It, it makes a world of sense. And so it's like for, for those watching and playing at, at home in your home offices and such, so much of it comes down to not the feature functionality of RPA itself, but what it's actually automating. And that speaks that somehow all roads take us back to process debt, Francis. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll send that on its uh, happy way. Uh, but I want to come back to it because Eddie, a, just on this topic of, of cloud, and it's all about what you're actually automating, I want to go back to the cloud element of the solution that you walked us through before. Because I always like to say, perhaps this will give the automation world hope, um, but would really like you to, to confirm and, and articulate to our, our uh, webinar group today just exactly how cloud figures into your solution and why this has been important. You may be on mute, Eddie. Ooh, thank you for that. I was. <laughs> so as, as I was saying earlier, uh, we are our own customers. We help support and ensure that Google Cloud is always up and running. But at the same time, the fact that Google Cloud is always up and running helps support us as well. Our DevOps is run completely on Google Cloud. So <clears throat> our development, our QAing, our deployments to production, our dog fooding, all of that is done completely and hosted completely on Google Cloud, including our RPA services. So 
we've had you know complete uptime. Uh, our DevOps is supported end to end, um, and all of our machines are are virtual machines. That helps us scale. So whenever we need to uh, deploy new little baby robots, they are they have machines ready for them. Uh, if we need to increase the number of servers to help uh, distribute our loads between uh, all of our different users, that's also done completely using Google Cloud too. Got it. Okay. So again, just to underscore the point, uh, it is possible, but it comes down to a lot of, to Francis's point, what you're automating and where it already sits to begin with. Uh, but again, Eddie, just want to underscore it is a, an essential piece of the solution that you've put together as part of Project Moose and your overarching automation, um, Google's overarching automation uh, approach to, to help manage the, the Google network, correct? Yep, completely. Cool. Okay. All right. So with that in check, that's been our sort of fun going through some of these myths. But I do also want to have a little bit of narrative closure here because um, we've been sort of looking through this lens of, of playing around with some of these myths and so forth, but obviously any automation program is about achieving business benefits. And that's the thing. It's sort of, so we look back at some of the history of sort of RPA and broader process automation, uh, but for, particularly RPA and so much of the, the hype and pomp and circumstance that sat around it. There's a lot of science projects, like just tons and tons of POCs and pilots and such. Uh, but what I always like to remind folks of is that that's all well and good. I mean, you have to develop a competency base uh, and knowledge, but it's all about um, what are you actually trying to do, do with it? What is your objective? And regardless of whether it's something gigantic and lofty like digital transformation or whether it's just running a, a particular process or task more effectively, that's okay as long as it's actually fit for purpose. But Eddie, I'd love for you to take a few moments and talk us through uh, what you guys have actually achieved and maybe a bit about where do you go from here? Yeah, happy to talk about that too. So when we first embarked on this journey, I'd say maybe about a year and a half ago with one of our partners who's here on our call, Brad, he and I were looking at some of our, you know, you know just from the beginning, this is what the current process is. We saw that there's a ton amount of manual toil. We saw our agents and coordinators have to navigate through hundreds of sites multiple times a day. Uh, just just to achieve the same thing over and over. And we saw that as an opportunity for us to implement uh, process automation. And in this case, it was robotics process automation. So after our journey here, it, it took us a while, um, just in terms of really identifying what all the opportunities were and then nailing them down and developing them each. Um, each of the processes development themselves were fairly quick. We're, to Francis's point, it took us you know, uh, maybe a, a few weeks to deploy, to develop, to test, and deploy a service end to end. What we also found is there's just a, a sheer number of processes that we needed to automate. But today, we it we finally were able to achieve. You know, 80% of our ticket volume is fully automated. We're able to scale completely without any uh, human interaction to complete these requests. As soon as the request com comes in, it gets fulfilled. That really has been able to. Uh, really improve our cycle time, it's you know, 10 times faster. Instead of having to wait for one of our coordinators to see the, see the request, uh, facilitate it, submit it, and complete it end to end, now the process automation can submit the request as soon as it comes in. This has also helped with data integrity, where in the past, you know, humans make mistakes sometimes, right? And even though they're diligent, and just in, from a sheer number of tickets and processes that they're going through, sometimes um, there is a hiccup here and there. Now with, with the automation in place, uh, end to end, as soon as a service request comes in on our side, our bots or APIs in some cases are able to send the requests over to partner systems um, exactly as they come in. The most important part out of all of this is that we have much better uh, resource efficiency. Instead of having our Google engineers and coordinators taking up, taking up time of their precious day to submit these requests, they're now free to help manage any escalations, any issues, and to help identify other opportunities and build solutions to help improve the process end to end. Got and it. I would be, I'm sorry, one more thing is, I would be remiss to say, I, my team overall had a, a ton of support from the Google Cloud team um, within my organization as well. But there are a number of uh, business analysts and developers who definitely helped us out in the whole process. I wanted to call out uh, a, a little call out to Nimesh on my team. He has been fundamental and instrumental in making sure our program is up and running. 
I love it, Eddie. I appreciate the, uh, I think the, the call out and recognition is, is always spectacular. Uh, and if there's ever a year that we needed more of that, bring the love, I love it. Um, okay, so that's fabulous. Where do you think you're going from here? Like what's, what's next for you? You've obviously accomplished, back to my earlier point of, you have to have the end in mind. So you're making fabulous progress. I love your points, by the way, about how it's both just the speed of the build, but now you, you've created this, this improved process that's just uh, fit for purpose and so much faster. Um, does this continue to go forward for other use cases, ex et cetera, Eddie? Yeah, our success within this application has definitely been uh, celebrated within our team, but also a number of other teams have reached out to us seeing that you know, we took what used to be a very manual and toilsome process that was taking up a bunch of our teammates to team and now freeing them up for other opportunities. We're seeking to expand into supporting other teams as well, as well as now that we do have time and now that we have more time and resources, we are trying to Im increase and Im I'm sorry, improve our cycle time even more outside of just our, our organization and our team. There are many work streams upstream that we're trying to improve as well. And have using automation as, you know, part of our native structure, we're trying to implement that for them as well. Super, I love that expansion. And back to some of my points uh, as we kicked off this webinar today, uh, it's not just for IT, it's not just for engineering, it's not just for business, it's wherever you can find value with your eye on what, what the mission is, what you're trying to accomplish. I will also point out that I think inherent in some of your comments, Eddie, it's just a very mm -hmm. strong focus on, obviously, it's, it's helping um, keep the Google network up and running, but I also hear just a very strong element of supporting um, what I mentioned when I talked about our HFS one office model is a real strong focus on employee experience. Do you, do you agree with that? I completely agree. Yep. That's a, important for us because we want our teams to love the application that they're in, even, even with it doing so much of the backend support. Got it. Thank you for that. Hey, Francis, I'd love you to have you weigh in on this as we sort of wax eloquent about the, uh, the power of and. Um, what do you feel like is, is fair to state that enterprises um, should expect from this from a benefits standpoint? And I'll sort of couch this to you back. It's, it's not one of the formal myths that we were trying to bust today, but I mean, just sort of the, the years of looking at all of the claims about RPA it's that it's going to save you 80% of your cost. And I say it in that sort of funny voice, which is it's just always been really, really hard to substantiate it. And you've made some, some great points earlier about it's, it's that iceberg model of what you see isn't always what you get. But just would love any thoughts you have on um, ways to think about um, downstream benefits. Yeah, I mean, listen, RPA is not old. Uh, sorry, it's, it's not new. <laughs> it's not old. Uh, RPA is not, not, it, it's not new. It's 15 to 20 years old. It just got renamed in 2012. So, so we've had, what, 15, and even if you just, you know, uh, think on it simply, eight years, eight years of RPA, where has all the, uh, you know, all this automation and savings gone? And there's been some 80% and 100% and 400% savings. But they're not very many. Most organizations, and I think HFS have written about this, getting to scale has always been hard. But next year, maybe it'll get more, right? <laughs> Everybody's in pilot. Or maybe we've got 10 bots, or maybe we've got 20. The reality is they have their place. But moving to digital transformation, the excuse for people who live in the RPA world is digital transformation is hard and expensive. But it's not, not anymore. I agree it used to be. I lived there for 40 years, building applications, monolithic systems, legacy code to maintain. That has all changed with the advent of low code platforms. And of course, when you do it right, you almost eliminate that underpinning iceberg that what you've got on the top is built for change. When business decide their, their business model changes or they need new business rules or they need to configure something new, you can do those things on a low code platform in minutes and hours and days instead of months for backlog and years. And so investing in transformation is key. That's the power of and, and, and you use RPA to plug any gaps to get you there where you just as, just as Eddie described, you know, it's great because those systems are not open. They're not in Google's control. Connect to them with RPA. It's awesome. That's what it's designed for. But when you start using RPA as the front end, thinking it's going to digitally transform your business, I'm afraid you might just topple that iceberg. Gotcha. Thank you for those perspectives, Francis. 
And I think one of the, I always like to point out, Francis, so your company, you were founder and at one point CEO of an RPA firm called OpenSpan, which Pega uh, acquired in 2016. The sheer fact that you're still there fighting the good fight, Francis, just also, I think, underscores not just your personal belief, um, but again, as you, you stated, 40 years of being part of this marketplace, um, just that potential, um, in many cases, still forthcoming value uh, about the power of uh, low code. Uh, that uh, is is the the sort of the wonderful journey and opportunity that many enterprises still have to experience. So well, so and large yeah. organizations like Google using the you know in this case a plug for Pega. I try to be quite neutral because if you you know Pega has some great low code orchestration, no code technology. It's a phenomenal um, and that's why phenomenal technology and that's why I'm at Pega. But this is a movement and it's it's exponentially bigger than RPA as it should be. And so I, my, 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 you know, if we want to really um, myth bust, I would say those of you who are only in RPA, whatever you do next in your careers or wherever you're going, go look and start looking at this low code and these orchestration technologies that will change the way you think about software development forever. Gotcha. And I did note you had something in, in, on LinkedIn yesterday, Francis, that was talking exactly a, about that, but it was perhaps getting a bit more to the, the definition of what we mean by low code, no code. Uh, but for perhaps for a different time. All right, I'd like to bring us to a little bit of narrative closure here. I always call this affectionately the lightning round, but um, Eddie, I'd love to start with you. I'd love for you to share just your, your best quick thought uh, for a tangible takeaway for our delegates today uh, about either automation myth busting and or why automation needs to be a native part of any enterprise who wants to work more effectively. What do you have for us? Yeah, happy to talk through that as well. Yeah, automation is, you know, it, it runs in the blood of everything we do. We have to identify areas we're improving, qualify them, quantify them, de define the solution, develop it, which we've done on a Google Cloud. And then we've been able to really see the outcomes very, very quickly. It's not, it's not intangible for a bunch of teams. People may say, you know, it, it's not for us. People may say it, it may take too long to develop, but I think our use case developed, demonstrates that both of those myths are untrue. Got it. Thank you for that. Francis, what would you like to toss into the pot here? No, I think I, was, I, I mean, I, I think generally at the end of the day, do not take my word for it. Do not take my word for it and why I'm at Pega. Just look at these other technologies that are out there. Um, and the, it, the world has not stood still. Kubernetes, microservices, low code, no code. This world is changing and it's changing so fast and it's exciting. And, and to your point, that's why I stayed at Pega. It's just a great time to be in software. Um, and I'm glad I'm out of being just a pure play RPA vendor because I've got so many other toys to play with in the and narrative. Gotcha. Thank you for that, Francis. I'll toss my own in sort of off the back of the technology point. Uh, I've been known to say that technology, while it's obviously the gigantic enabler of so many of these solutions, it's always really essential to, to know the why, back to all of my points I made about business outcomes. You got to know why you're doing this. Uh, why is it important? So if you know the why before you get to the, the how and the what, which is often the technology piece and the processes you need to change, uh, you're helping to pave your way to success as opposed to starting with, hey, I've got this tool. What can I actually do with it? You have to have something with the, the end in mind. Okay, so let's do this. We've got not much time, but I do think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, I know we, we looked at um, some of these throughout, um, but just looking at a, a couple of these as they come through, um, I think one, because we, we spent for good reason, we spent a bit of time talking about um, RPA as the conduit into broader process automation and process debt and such. Um, but one thing that we didn't mention much of is where, where does AI come into the mix? Um, what's the importance of the cognitive capability? Um, honestly, either Eddie or Francis um, would love um, um, one or both of your thoughts on how that fits in. Go ahead first, if you like, Eddie. Sure. So we use AI to help take into account, you know, based off of the history of, in our use case, based off of the history of our dispatches, based off of who's available, uh, based off of all these different rules, engines, and uh, process requirements, we help to identify who's the best resource each time, and if they're not available, who to go next. 
And then where RPA fits into that is once the AI says, you know, this is the best use case to follow, we, we plug in RPA to help engage whoever that is. So AI for us helps, that, that's a huge time saver as well. On top of just, you know, removing the manual uh, toilsome components, instead of having our folks have to go in and manage each of these tickets end to end, they can instead rely on AI, rely on business logic, rely on tickets and anything that they would like to implement and allow the services to run without, without them needing to baby, be babysitted. Thank you, Eddie. Francis, you want to weigh in? Yeah, I think another myth around, you know, AI can't be in a silo, right? There are times when you can use AI. I think, you know, a couple of years ago, it was going to be intelligent RPA, right? And you can use AI on screens and documents, et cetera. But really, you've got to think about if you were to connect all of your data sources and interactions, and it's a big if, but that's the ultimate aim, then you really start to change the game. This center, this center brain that can collect all of the data from all of the interactions going on in your company can now start to make real serious predictions for your customers. You can even preempt what your customers are going to do before they know they're going to do it themselves based upon this data. But you've got to start collecting the data from a central into a central brain, not a bit of AI for RPA and a bit of AI for your messaging or a bit of AI for this channel or whatever. Bring that AI together into a central brain and it can start to revolutionize the way your business does business with its clients. And it's, it's, it's also a, another great aspect to this, this technology. Yep. And it, it also really ties into that power of and that we were talking about. But I, I agreed um, with both of your points, but just Francis on that, like, do not take a siloed approach here. I think it's very important. All right, we'll take one more just to, to wind it out. But we've got an interesting one uh, from the, the delegates, which uh, any thoughts on what the biggest benefits uh, are from running um, RPA in the cloud? Uh, and, and also a bit tongue in cheek here, isn't this just running the same software on someone else's computer? Uh, any thoughts on that, gentlemen? Well, look, I think running anything in the cloud makes sense. If you don't have to worry about hardware and infrastructure power, you know, maintenance, that, that's fine. But when you, you know, then it's sort of like, okay, you're going to run RPA in the cloud, right? Okay, it's, a, it's you know, I always used to joke, it's like taking your, um, you know, your old car and get, trying to turn it into a fully autonomous vehicle. It just doesn't make sense. But cloud itself is a very powerful, and all businesses are moving to the cloud, even companies that said three years ago, we can't go cloud for whatever reason, they're all moving to cloud. And sure, there's, there's a benefit from running in the cloud. But ultimately, if 98% of what you're automating isn't running in the cloud, then there isn't as much of a benefit. But that, but sure, run it in the cloud. But all of your digital transformation should be, you know, cloud native. You should be able to run it in the cloud. Whatever you build today should be able to run in cloud. Gotcha. Anything yeah, to that point, right? Yep. Yeah, for us, we, we were able to start in the cloud. And a lot of these services, uh, we're because we're hosted in the cloud, have been able to interact with a bunch of other Google tools. So, of course, for us, we're always going to push. <laughs> There's always mixed solutions, right? You could be hybrid model, you could be in, in completely in the cloud. For us, it's been able to help us scale and develop and deploy uh, more rapidly, but it may be different for other things, right? Yeah, I think very fair, Eddie, but I, the extensibility point is a gigantic one though. Um, okay, so with that in mind, we're actually just a couple minutes over, but we do, all good things must come to an end. I uh, want to extend a, just a gigantic thank you to Eddie Din from Google, Francis Cardin from Pega Systems as well as to all of our delegates that showed up today, hung in there with us and asked us great questions. Uh, everybody have a great rest of the day and this officially concludes our webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Lydia. Thanks, Elena. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.